The Fletcher Seventh-day Adventist Church is a Christian people who believe Jesus is the Son of God, the hope of the world, who died on the cross to redeem us all for eternal life with God. Our purpose is to lift Jesus up and love people in. Visit our website at www.fletchersda.org. And now be blessed by the Holy Spirit as you listen to a Bible message by Pastor Ivan Blake. I go a fishing. We will also go with thee. Children, have you any meat? Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and you shall find. the Lord. Bring up the fish which you have now caught. Come and dine. you to bow your heads with me in prayer. God in heaven, thank you that we can eat with you. And it's more about being with you than it is about eating. And even now in this church, you create hunger and you satisfy that hunger. Please do that for us now. For Jesus' sake, amen. In John chapter 21, Jesus is with his church. He is with his church. A picture of Jesus with his church. Why do I say church? It's because those disciples, yes, they are disciples, but we miss what church really means. So here it is. Church is a group of individuals who believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He died, He lived, He died, He rose again. 
He intercedes now. And he is coming back again to give a complete salvation for his church. That's the church. And Jesus is with his church on the beach. In fact, there are seven members of that church right there on the beach with Jesus. Now, something about that church that I want you to take note of. It seems to me that the church back then is a model for what the church can be today, our church. So I want to go through that. You know, it's very easy for us to miss what uh, John gives us and says to us about the church in the first three verses. So I want you to look very carefully at this, where he says in John chapter 21, verse 1, later Jesus appeared, later after his resurrection, Jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee. And this is how it happened. Take note. Several of the disciples were there. That is not a very good translation of the Greek because the Greek actually says that several of the disciples were together. And you may say, what's the big deal? They were there, they were together. But think about it. The word together can be understood in two ways. The one is, we're together here in this building physically. But what if we are here for the same purpose, and we are here together, united together. Do you see the expansion of that word? And it almost suggests to me, oh, sure, these disciples, they are there together physically, no question. But it does tell me as I look at these men and think who it is that have come together, that there is more than physical togetherness. There is a change what has taken place there is a unity. So consider who is together there on the beach, at least seven of the 11 remaining disciples. It says, first of all, Simon Peter and Thomas. Now, Thomas is very interesting that John would mention that he is there because wasn't Thomas absent, you remember, recently from being together with the disciples? And he missed out big time. He missed out seeing Jesus alive. I can just imagine that after the experience, Thomas said, you know, I better hang out with these friends of mine, whether I get along with them or not, whether I really would like to choose not being with them. But it seems like if I'm together with them, Jesus is likely to show up where they are. So I'm going to be together with them. And Thomas is mentioned specifically this time. I also find it curious that John should mention, first of all, Simon Peter and Thomas. Simon Peter, the denier of Jesus, that he knows Jesus? And Thomas, the doubter? Jesus had very strange people part of his church. All kinds of varieties of people. They are doubters. They are deniers. And they are part of Christ's church. It was that way then. I guess to say it's that way today. His church is made up of all kinds. The varieties are endless. All kinds of sinners. I'm encouraged. I mean, this is post the resurrection. And the first thing we think about when we see these two names is denier, he's there. The doubter, he is there. Has Jesus not yet started cleaning up his church? Oh, yeah, I know they are forgiven. I know that they are now changed, transformed by the resurrection of Jesus. That's all part of the picture. But don't tell me that they never, ever had problems like they had before. This was an ongoing struggle that they would have. Now, the other thing that makes me uh, 
curious about this in verse 3. Well, he talks about Nathanael from Galilee and Canaan and Galilee, and then the sons of Zebedee and two other disciples. He doesn't get very specific about them, but he's very specific about Peter and Thomas. That really says something. And these seven are what? Together as the church on the beach that day. And then in verse 3, Simon Peter speaks up. Ollie is the first to speak. He says, I'm going fishing. And if you look carefully at the Greek, when you talk to somebody who knows the Greek well, Simon is not saying, well, forget about you guys, I'm going off fishing. The Greek is actually stated in such a way, he uses the language to make it sound like, I want you to join me in going fishing. That's interesting. And then when we read the, their response where they say, we will go with you, they don't say, well, we're going also. They're saying, we're going what? With you. They want to be with Peter together. Something has happened with these men that wasn't present before. Because as you read the New Testament story, it's very obvious that these men, these 12 men who were followers of Jesus for three and a half years, they were very different from each other. They did not get along very well. Have you noticed that? I mean, it's quite amazing the mixed bag that Jesus brought together as his followers. Uh, and we notice that whenever we meet people that very quickly we see there are different temperaments, and those temperaments don't always get well, get on well together. And that's true about those disciples, because you know what? They were arguing, they were bickering, they were elbowing each other for the highest position. They were trying to outmaneuver the other. This was the constant trend, as if Jesus, for three and a half years, couldn't manage to get these guys to get along well. They were on each other's nerves, constantly. And these men, not getting along until now, something happened. What? They met Jesus. They met the risen Christ and the meaning of that risen Christ who was dead, who was now alive. That meaning so impacted them, it changed their attitude, not only towards Jesus, but to one another also. So that these men are now together united together because of the risen Jesus Christ. They are now together. You know, we're much the same, aren't we? You know, you meet a lot of people in your life, and it doesn't take very long when you discover that some of the people that you meet, you can't really stand very well. You don't stand, can't stand them. In fact, for you, the, word, the world is worse off with them there. And people refer to those as those people. You know, you go on social media, very quickly you learn about those people. You talk to other people, and very quickly you hear about them talking about those people. Would it surprise you to discover that some may talk about you as those people? And the church is full of those people. It's strange, really, but Guess what? You're those people to some other those people. But the risen Christ changes all that. The risen Christ changes all that, experiencing that risen Christ, because now we're all together when impacted by the risen Christ. We cannot be together in unity by good resolutions, by following some techniques, you know, three steps to become united. It doesn't work. That, it may work for a moment, but it won't work for long. It is by being impacted by the risen Christ. There is something about being together that makes Jesus more real to us. Now, listen very carefully. You're in John chapter 20 and 21. The differentness of the disciples shows in a very subtle way. 
If you read very carefully, there's John. John is a rationalist. He's a thinker. This man needs a lot of evidence in order to come to a conclusion that he will believe. And so we read how that he goes into the tomb, and he notices how the linen, the burial cloths, have been folded and put in a certain way. Did Jesus actually do that with John in mind? Reading those chapters, it seems pretty clear, you know, Peter rushes in and out of believing. Now he's believing, now he's disbelieving. Then he's believing, then he's disbelieving. And Jesus patiently lets him grow in his journey of coming to faith. Each disciple, Thomas, <laughs> great example. Thomas wants a sensory experience. He wants to reach out and touch before he'll believe. And Jesus lets him. Jesus lets him do that. Each disciple brings out from Jesus something different than all the rest do. You see where I'm going with this? It is only when they are together, these disciples, these believers, that they learned how Jesus worked with impetuous Peter, how he worked with traitorous Judas, how he worked with doubting Thomas, how he worked with each 12 of them in a different way, revealing a different facet to the character of Jesus. You see, you see, you see something different about Jesus in each person that is different to you. If we were all the same, and we're all believers in Jesus, we will only see the same thing in Jesus as everyone else does. But you get to know Jesus by being together in community. And in that word community is the word unity. In community with those who are different than you are. It's only by being different, being together with those that are different from you, that you actually discover the multiple facets of Jesus Christ. So get this. Without Jesus, you would never get to know those people. But without those people you will never get to know Jesus. Now, don't start praying that God will send obnoxious people into the church, please. That's not the point. <laughs> but do you see how being impacted by the risen Christ brings about not just unity as we talk about it in general, but supernatural unity that we cannot bring about unless God Jesus brings it about as we become impacted by his resurrection. This means that you can get along with people that apart from Jesus, you would never, ever have anything to do with. You wouldn't give them the time of day. But impacted by the risen Christ, you not only get along with those people, you now get to love and serve those people. Sometimes we're struck by the way someone in the church looks or how someone in the church behaves or how someone in the church worships. And we notice that their opinions and their preferences and their tastes and their style of worship is unfamiliar to us. And because it is unfamiliar, we very quickly decide that they're not just different, but they're wrong. What's flashing through your mind right now? They're wrong. And sometimes we assume that if people are different to us, they've just got to be out of line with God. God has a work to do in their hearts to bring them to where we are. We are so good at putting our own cultural preferences into thus said the Lord language. 
They're not principles. There's nothing moral about those preferences. But to us, they are laws in concrete. And if God doesn't agree with us, we'll have to work with Him. So the question is, am I willing to accept that what I see that is different in those around me is not wrong, but it may in fact, if I adopt it, make my walk with Jesus more precious. So I have a vision for the Fletcher Seventh-day Adventist Church, and that vision is simply this, that we will acknowledge our differentness from one another. Acknowledge it. Acknowledge that we are different from each other, but then that we will, in fact, celebrate. That's the next step from acknowledging, but we will celebrate our diversity in age, in gender, in character development, our diversity in, in ethnicity, our diversity in viewpoint and taste and preference and, and culture, our level of maturity, and that we will then progress from celebrating that. That's a huge order, but we will progress from that by actually actively making room in our lives to include the uncomfortable differentness of others and not judge them, not avoid them. Not going to look for another group of people who are more like us and less like them, but that we will include them. Make them part of our lives. We will realize that this is an ideal, but this ideal can only be achieved by us allowing the gospel of Jesus Christ to so penetrate our hearts that we will understand that God has included our differentness into His family. God makes diversity a permanent thing because God is a God of diversity. Have you noticed that in nature? If everything was the same color, if everybody thought the same, then everyone but one would be unnecessary. But God has made us not just different in looks and everything else and our fingerprints being different. God has made us different in the way we think. And it's not always wrong thinking. So the church on the beach, they were known for their supernatural unity. The fulfillment of what Jesus said that your love for one another will prove to the world that you're my disciples. And later on he said, they'll prove to the world that I have been sent by the Father. That became evident in the early Christian church. It's displayed here on the beach. So I ask you, will you let the risen Christ impact your life so much that it will in fact be the practice in you to have supernatural unity with those around you who are different? That's the church on the beach. May it be the church at Fletcher. Though different, we are what? Together. Together. Well, there is something else here about this story that is really fascinating, and that is it's actually the heart of the story, and that is about Peter and how he has changed. You know, if Peter can change, Ivan can change. And if Ivan can change, most of you can change. Here is Peter. You know, John is a specialist in telling us a life-changing fish story. That's a true story. It's almost too good to be true, but it is true. Now, you know, this time of the year, we've been talking a lot about Martin Luther, and most people have learned more about Martin Luther the last few months than they have in all their lives until now. And most people here are worship Martin Luther, but very few people know, and many will be shocked to realize that Martin Luther was a pretty obnoxious guy. He didn't get along with a lot of people, especially his enemies. He was hard and he was harsh. This guy was cruel to people. If you read the story, you read the history. He had no good word to say about any Jewish person. Martin Luther. 
Well, he had a friend by the name of Philip Melanchthon. Philip Melanchthon was also a, ref a reformer, a scholar, a friend of Martin Luther. But Melanchthon was very different. He was opposite to Martin Luther. He was a gentleman. He was calm and a peace-loving person who, who liked to bring people together, Melanchthon. So as people were watching these two guys acting together and working together, Pretty soon, you know, some of these friends came to Philip Melanchthon and said to him, you know, there's a mystery around here. You and Martin Luther are so different. Just tell us something. How come you're so devoted to this hard to get along with Martin Luther? And Philip Melanchthon had a very simple answer, and he simply said, I have learned the gospel from him. That makes me think of Peter. Obnoxious Peter, always arguing, always impetuous, always got his mouth open before his brain is engaged. Peter is just such a terrible guy to have around. And it's almost too good to be true that from this man, Peter, we learn the gospel. We learn the gospel. This is what the gospel can do in a man's life. This is what the gospel can do in the church's life. It goes something like this. You know, one of the greatest contrasts in the Bible is to read about Peter in Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, and then in John chapter 21. Because in Luke chapter 5, as well as in John 21, there's a story, a fish story. Very similar, but some stark differences. It's also about the disciples in Luke 5. There they are fishing all night and catching nothing. But this time Jesus is in the boat with them. And Jesus says to Peter, man, take the boat out a little further and put your nets in. And Peter's arguing with him. You know, Peter, this guy's always got something against everything that Jesus said, mostly. But Peter does this. He throws his net in and he pulls the net up, tries to. No one can. He has to get help. Other boat comes along. Other guys trying to get this. And now you notice a remarkable thing in the story of Peter in Luke chapter 5, how he responds to this miracle that Jesus has performed. And you will see that here in Luke chapter 5, verse 8. When Simon Peter realized what had happened, you know, the net is so full, it wants to sink the ship. He fell down to his knees before Jesus. And what did he say? Oh, Lord. Depart, get away from me, Jesus. You leave me. I am such a sinful man. Two stories, very similar. The major difference is how, how Peter responds to the miracle in Luke 5 and Luke and John chapter 21. This time in John 21, Jesus is not in the boat. He is on the beach, and he tells Peter, and John tells Peter, it is the Lord. And look what Peter does. When Peter heard, when Peter heard it was the Lord, what did he do? He put on his tunic, he threw himself into the water, and he headed to shore. What do you notice here? The complete opposite. You see, the first time, Peter couldn't get away quick enough from Jesus. The second time, he cannot get to Jesus quick enough. What happened? Why the difference? Previously, Peter was full of himself. Now he is full of Jesus. Fear has turned into assurance. His miserable failure where he denies Jesus three times and where he pulls out the sword and nearly spoils the whole thing. And this man has shattered self-confidence now. And he is healed by the love that Jesus showed him. The awe of guilt has turned into the awe of love. The desire to run from Jesus became now the desire to run to Jesus, or swim, if you like. The Jesus he followed for three and a half years is now a new and different Jesus. Jesus. His nasty flaws are now driving him to Jesus and not away from Jesus. 
because you see now he had this smidgen understanding of being saved by grace. And that's all it took. Knowing he is saved by grace. He now knew that he was accepted into the family of God. As is. He's a child of God. He's a new person. Can we learn from this? What kind of church are we? Flawed and faulty and weak like Peter? But who have the assurance of being saved by grace. As our cold following Jesus for all these years with fear that he will make us pay for all the wrong and bad stuff that we've done. Has that been supernaturally changed into a life of continuous running to Jesus with our guilt? With the assurance that he paid the price and has set us free? Are we that church? Are we waiting first to be made perfect before we'll feel free to run to Jesus? Or do we know that he is the perfect, welcoming Jesus who especially welcomes sinners, imperfect people? Is that the kind of church we are? And when other people with flaws and faults see how we run to Jesus with our flaws and faults, do they then also run to Jesus because they see we don't judge them. We just call them to come with us to run to Jesus. Is that the kind of church we are? What kind of God do you know? The God who makes you run from him or the God who makes you run to him? The God who loves you so much that you cannot help but run to him. See, the church on the beach was made up of people who were supernaturally changed in their relationship with God. And that's why they could be supernaturally changed in their relationship with each other. I'm wondering, friends, will you let the risen Christ impact you that way? Take it off the pages of a book on doctrines that you don't just believe in this idea that he is resurrected, but you will internalize it to the point where it transforms you and changes you. That's what convinced the Roman world that Christianity was right. Because these people were so transformed by the resurrection. That's the thing they preached about. He is risen was their theme. And look how it has changed us. It will change you too, the risen Christ. Well, you know, from supernatural change comes supernatural intimacy. Now, we are changed by grace, but we are also drawn into an intimate walk with Jesus. That's what this church on the beach also teaches us about. Elvira and I spent a delightful few days on the beach out here in the East Coast, but then made us think about the story where Jesus, in fact, said, come, y'all, let's eat. You have to say that in North Carolina, come, y'all. You know, there's no other way. Jesus has prepared some fish and bread for his disciples on the beach, and Jesus wants to serve them. Come, y'all, let's eat. And then it says in verse 13, then Jesus served them the bread and the fish. Jesus served them. Now, in ancient times, eating together was a very significant event. Today, well, it's kind of nice. It's a friendly gesture. But you know, we are good at eating on the run. There are many meals where I'm spending most of the time standing, doing something else while eating. And some of us even have this quick stop at Taco Bell and get ourselves a seven-layer bean burrito that we eat in the car while we're traveling to the next appointment. That's how we do it. You know, it's cheap, it's quick, it's, well, it's fast, and it's easy, and it's filling, and we are satisfied. Are we? 
You know, in ancient times, if you eat together, you're making a pledge of friendship to that person. It wasn't just about the food. It was about relationship. I want you to be my friend is the message of eating together back then. It meant binding hearts together. Where Jesus is saying, I don't want you just to believe in me. I want you to be my friend. I don't want you just to obey me. I want you to be my friend. Come and eat. Come eat. And one of the sweetest reasons why God saved you is because he likes you. He wants to enjoy you. He wants your whole life with him to be a fellowship of eating, of feasting on him. He is the bread of life. He likes having you around. You're the best thing ever that has come his way as you run to him. The Bible says, as a man rejoices over his new wife, so your God will rejoice over you. That's Isaiah 62 verse 5. You see, God can live anywhere in the universe, but he's decided to live in your heart. He loves you. He's crazy about you, this God. How do we eat today with Jesus? I just love one of my favorite verses there in Job chapter 15, verse 16. It says, your word was found and I ate it. And your word became the joy and rejoicing of my heart because I'm called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. You see, as we, as we come and run to Jesus at his word, and we don't study his word out of duty, we study his word to feast on Jesus, to find Jesus, to enjoy Jesus, to grow like Jesus. When we do that, his intimacy with us just grows. It just develops. It just flows when we do that with his word. That intimacy Jesus loves for. Take time with Jesus. Turn off whatever you need to turn off in order to feast on Jesus, to turn your eyes on Jesus. Jesus wants to eat with us more than we realize and more than anything in the world, and he wants us to want to eat with him more than anything else. Because he knows that the Christian life is nothing else but fellowship with Jesus that flows over and serves others. Jesus says, eat with me. Do you have that intimacy with Jesus? Church on the beach experienced supernatural unity, supernatural change, but also supernatural intimacy. And you say, but that's a tall order, preacher. I mean, how do we know that's for us? How can I know that is really for me? My life is a shambles. My life is just a rat race. I am full of doubts. I'm full of, full of issues that I don't know how to solve. How can you talk about supernatural unity, supernatural change, supernatural intimacy? How can that be real for me? The answer is the meal that Jesus served on the beach. Because I want you to look once again at Jesus. His gifts are wonderful, but they're only possible because of that meal on the beach. How do we know it's for us? It's when Jesus Christ cooks that meal, the Thanksgiving meal. When he cooks that meal, he is saying something about himself that is so powerful, and here it is. See Jesus appearing there on the beach. He shows up as his disciples have come toward him. And what does Jesus not say. I mean, now, look at this. He has risen from the dead. This is a new Jesus, glorified. And he doesn't say to them, all right, fellows, now it's time for you to recognize who I am. After all, I am the risen Christ. Time for you to be on your knees, worshiping me, the majesty of heaven. He doesn't do that. He had the right to do that, but he doesn't do that. Jesus doesn't say to them, all right, guys, I remember very well what happened this last Thursday night. I'd like us to talk about that the way you let me down. I'd like us just to work through that a little bit so that this can be settled once for all. He doesn't do that. What does he do? He says, I made breakfast for you. Let's eat. The humble server who said, who is more important at the table? The one who is served or the one who does the serving? For the Son of Man came not to serve, be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. The serving Christ 
The serving Christ. And so he says to you and to me today, I have come to serve you with unity, with change, with intimacy. I don't demand it. I don't require it. I don't even give you the steps to get there. I serve you with it. By eating with me, fellowshipping with me, having a life of being together, we eat together. So the invitation for you and for me today is simply this. Because Jesus broke his body in order that he can serve us with himself, he is saying to us, come, let's eat together. I don't want to watch you do it. I want to do it with you. Let's eat together with Jesus. Let's eat for a change. Let's eat to be intimate with Jesus. Come, you all. Let's eat. Thank you, Lord, for this privilege of being united with our God by faith because of the risen Christ. It's much more than a teaching, Lord. It's a life. We rejoice in it. We want it to impact the way we relate to you, but to each other as well. And we ask you even now for that supernatural unity, that supernatural change, that supernatural intimacy. Oh God, thank you that you speak to our hearts and you simply say, come, come and eat with me. Lord, we, we respond. We want our lives to be a fellowship with our God, to be the church, the church on the beach, the church anywhere, the church every day, 24-7. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. We trust your relationship with God has been strengthened from what you have heard today. Please visit our website at www.fletchersda.org. May God give you His peace and joy.